This is a podcast of the Institute of Actuaries of Australia. The views and opinions expressed in Institute podcasts are those of the speakers or authors and do not necessarily reflect the views of their employers or the Institute, its members, directors, officers, employees or agents. Welcome to your Actuaries Institute Dialogue podcast. I'm Rick Shaw. I'm a partner at Deloitte and a fellow of the Institute. This podcast aims to give you an overview of the Actuaries Thought Leadership Series, The Dialogue, Leading the Conversation. The Dialogue papers cover a wide range of topical issues from genetics and life insurance to health insurance affordability. And today we're talking social risks for a financial services business. This is a hot topic with the Royal Commission having just kicked off and the banks and insurers facing intense community and governance scrutiny. In his paper, Ian asks why, with all the money, resources and intellect they spend on managing risk, why are institutions still being castigated by the press, politicians and social media for unacceptable attitudes and behaviour? Are attitudes changing in society? Are our institutions keeping up with changing attitudes? What do we do about fake news? So to help us explore these fascinating questions, we welcome Ian Lockman. Thanks for joining us, Ian. Uh, thanks very much, Rick. It's good to be here. Ian, in your paper, you make reference to something of a failure of risk management. Why do you think that risk management has failed? That is a really good place to start because if you sat down with, say, the CEOs of the major institutions, say, 10 years ago, and said this is what it could be like in 2016, 2017, 2018, with parliamentary inquiries, uh, CEOs being interviewed by those parliamentary committees, multiple investigations by ASIC, TV reviews of performance of life insurance claims, etc., if you had proposed to them then that this is what it might be like, they probably would have said it couldn't happen. And one of the reasons they would have said it couldn't happen is because they manage risks in their business and they have appropriate resources, time, commitment and so on to managing those risks. And yet you can easily mount an argument now that risk management has completely failed those institutions because look at where they've actually found themselves. Not just the major institutions, but the industry itself. So my starting point was sitting there saying, how on earth could this have happened? And that led me to think about changes in society and attitudes and behaviours in society. And so I started to delve into this a little bit more deeply. And from that came this paper. Let's define some terms here, Ian. You talk about risk management. Mm. One of the things you do, which I think is quite valuable in your paper, is delve into a set of risks that even if they were around 10, 15 years ago, were not as vocal as they are now. This is the social risks that you talk about. You're dividing it into internal social risks, where you talk about cynicism risk of the staff, patronism risk, self-awareness risk, and so on. And then looking at the external social risks is very useful. But what I wonder is if you feel that these risks are ones that come about from a generational change where the people coming through now, the so-called millennials, are a little more sceptical about our corporations. Oh, I think that's true. What we're seeing are significant changes in social attitudes. That's partly generational, but not exclusively. Part of what I'm arguing is that those changes in social attitudes are a function of the new world in which we operate. And the new world includes access to huge amounts of information, communicate in ways sort of unheard of before, such as the use of Twitter, the use of facilities like Facebook to spread an opinion, capabilities like phones, everybody's got a phone in their pocket, and so things that might have escaped scrutiny in the past don't escape scrutiny anymore. Individual consumers have, in effect, become vastly more powerful than was the case in the past. 20 years ago, behaviours in the financial services industry I would venture to say we're not as good as they are today, but attitudes have changed, tolerances have changed in society, and poor behaviour is being called out. So yes, it is partly a generational change, but I'm quite sure that people, even of the baby boomer generation, have different attitudes now to what they had 20 or 30 years ago 
their tolerance levels for poor behaviour are much lower, and their ability to call those issues out is much greater. So we have a different risk profile. Now I'm, I'm wondering if our management of risk, whether we need to refine or something more drastic to manage the changing risk profile. Do we have the existing frameworks and the existing institutional culture to allow us to uh, respond to uh, generational changing and attitudes towards government and large institutions, or is something more radical needed? In theory, there's no reason why you can't apply the same sort of risk management techniques to social risks uh, that you apply to any other risk. So you would identify them, you assess them, you um, mitigate them as you see fit, or you eliminate them, um, you report on them, you monitor and so on. So social risks can be addressed in exactly the same way. My argument is that institutions have failed probably in all steps of that process, starting with identification. So there's not an understanding of what those social risks are. Organisations haven't formally identified them as risks. They haven't therefore done anything about them. And consequently, they've, they've paid the price. So the starting point is you have to recognise these risks are there. You then have to have capabilities to manage those risks with all that entails, as I say, identification, etc. So the starting point, I think, has to be how do you actually identify these social risks and assess their implications for the business? And in the paper, I then go on to the idea of what I call risk sensing, where you have forward-looking sensors to understand what's happening in society, how attitudes and behaviours are, are changing, but importantly, looking forward for the implications of that, not looking backwards. And so often in risk management, in a uh, conventional risk management, risks are monitored in arrears. So key risk indicators, very often when you look at them, what organisations are using as key risk indicators, they're backward looking measures. And, and that simply can't work with something like social risk. So you have to have the capability to understand what's happening out there in society, changes in attitudes and so on, but then really importantly, understand what that might mean for your business in the future. That sounds very sensible given the framework that we're in at the moment. But let me just ask, we have the Thrill Commission going on at the moment, which has a lot to do with behaviour of our institutions. And I'll use the common shore, life claims, as an example. I would say that, uh, looking externally, common shore would have had a risk management framework and would have had in their risk management framework a risk appetite statement, and I assume would have been making some reference to brand value and so on. So we had a management structure in place. And I wonder if the frameworks in which we're doing this, handling risk management, is capable of evolving into something that is forward sensing as you're suggesting? Look, there's no reason why it can't, but the starting point has to be an understanding that backward looking measures aren't very helpful. So put aside social risks for a minute, yeah. a minute and let's just talk about risk management generally. You really do need indicators that keep you in touch with what's happening at the present time and where it's going. And that doesn't mean looking backwards and perhaps assessing a trend, because the trend may uh, only give you some indication as to how it might evolve into, in, the, in the future. In any sort of risk, what you want to be doing is understanding what's happening at the moment, understanding the trends, and understanding how it might evolve in the future, and the implications then for the business as it changes. If you then extend that basic principle to social risks, the question is, what sort of risk sensors should you actually have? And the answer to that question is not really clear because you know, this is sort of an evolving field and it's not obvious that expertise is available technologically or with people or in any other way. And again, part of my argument in the paper is that organisations need to develop these capabilities. There are no shortage of uh, organisations out there that will tell you that they'll be able to monitor what's happening on social media for you and, and so on. But to truly understand what's happening, because as we know, you can get a lot of misleading information and ideas on social media, to truly understand what's happening and what the implications are for the business, you need really deep insights. And I don't think organisations have that, uh, those deep insights at the moment, or even the capabilities to get those deep insights. 
and it's not clear where you might get those capabilities. So there you have a bit of a conundrum. How does the industry develop these capabilities properly assesses and manages these risks and so you don't end up in the sort of situation that we're in now. I think just to explore that a little further, we'll use what I think is the greatest failure we've had in recent times in this country of trust of an institution, which is the uh, Royal Commission into the churches and other institutions. Now if I think of the churches, what we had, it seemed to me, was an alignment of senior figures with the values, with constructs of their institution. What you call patronism risk, where the focus was on what is best for the church rather than what is best for the people. Yes, yeah, so, so what I tried to do in the paper was to break social risks down into various types. And I don't pretend that the classification that I've used is perfect or, or complete, but it helps understand the concept of social risks. So one of the classifications is cynicism risk, and that is the risk where an organisation cynically does the wrong thing, basically, because it believes it's in its own interest for that to occur. And so the example I give in the paper is of tobacco companies, and in particular tobacco companies promoting smoking to children in third world countries. So that's a cynical approach to doing business. Uh, patronism risk was another one, as you mentioned, and, and that's more about saying we know best. You, society, don't need to know too much about this. We, the institution, know best. We'll manage this. We won't necessarily tell you what's going on and so on. And there are other classifications of risks that might be relevant in the case that you cite. As you mentioned, I, I broke the risks down into what I called internal social risks and external social risks. And internal social risks are those that are a function of awareness, knowledge, understanding attitudes and behaviours of board and management. So they are a function of things that are within, broadly within the control of the organisation. But having said that, you can't just easily obtain that awareness and understanding that is needed to address internal risks. External social risks are not so much within the control of the organisation, they're, they're what's happening in society at large. But the institution, the organisation, needs to have a deep understanding of what is happening out in society, not so that they can necessarily change society, but so that they can adapt the way they're managing their business to minimise or eliminate any risk to that business. They need to be addressed separately and with a different mindset. I think there's also a possibility there's some overlap in the tangible actions to address these forward-looking risks. I wonder if what we have with a lot of risk management frameworks. It's a, it comes from a command and control culture within our corporations where a framework of risks is disseminated down to the workers. And I wonder, and I think the Catholic Church is a good example, if that approach inevitably leads to some alignment of personal value or some replacement of personal values with corporate values. And you're looking forward, you're risk sensing of empowering people to, within a framework, bring out their better selves. So you're onto a, a broader issue here, which I, I deliberately avoided in the paper, and that is um, culture or risk culture within an organisation. But let me, let me just touch on it briefly because it is relevant. I mentioned values risk in the paper. So values risk is where the values of the organisation uh, the espoused values, this is the way we want to operate and believe and, and so on, the espoused values are out of step with the attitudes of society. Now, not many organisations will suffer from that, but, um, but some will. The bigger issue is what I call true values risk, and that is where the real values in the organisation differ from the espoused values. And a behaviour which flows from the, the, the values are out of step, therefore, with what the company supposedly wants and certainly what the community expects. So that then leads to the idea of, of culture. So if you have an inappropriate culture, and now we're going well beyond social risk, but if you have an inappropriate culture with uh, remuneration drivers that don't support the espoused values, then inevitably the organisation will end up with some problems and some difficulties. One of the challenges with social risks is to ensure you have an appropriate culture. And that's a, that's a topic in its own right. But having an appropriate culture will certainly help you address social risks. 
I was captured by your concept of uh, risk velocity. Why damage to a business seems to be able to happen so quickly now. I, I just wondered if you could expand on that concept of risk velocity. Now, so risk velocity is more or less the speed at which the risk has an impact. And we all know the pace of change in the world has, has increased quite significantly. It doesn't matter what you're talking about, but technology has been at the, at the root of much of that change and the speed of change. And part of what I'm arguing here is that social risks have high risk velocity. So if you take the sexual harassment issue that's emerged over the last few months, well, look at how quickly that has had an impact. It emerged from basically nothing, probably within the last six months. And yet you've seen multiple high profile people damaged, probably irretrievably damaged in terms of their reputation. You've seen companies get themselves into great difficulty. You've seen companies come out and make statements about changes in their values, changes in the way they're going to monitor relationships between more powerful people and less powerful people and so on and so forth. That's happened really, really quickly. Allied with the idea of risk velocity, I use the term risk momentum. And I was trying to capture the idea that some of these risks are, are not independent. And once one starts to run, the other might be there and it, it'll multiply the impact of the first one. Uh, and a good example of that is the political risk. Uh, what, what did I actually call it? I called it political opportunism risk. And that's where it suits the political or the politicians to jump on a bandwagon. So accusations may not even necessarily be completely accurate, but accusations made, for example, by a TV documentary may cause immediate damage to, from a reputational point of view to an organisation. So they have an impact in their own right. They may be justified, they may not be, but they'll have an impact. And then the politicians decide it's in their interest to jump on that bandwagon. And so on the nightly news, instead of it just being a documentary, you then have senior politicians building the story, adding momentum and so on. So you get this idea of risk momentum. And, and the combination of the weight of those risks and velocity delivers momentum. These sort of risks, I argue, have high risk velocity and high risk momentum. One last question, Anne, on the increasing role of automation algorithms in our large institutions where these algorithms are such that the people who build the algorithms are continuously updated, and so the people who build the algorithms may not be aware of where they're going. And I wonder, what do you think about board? How, do, how does a board or senior management take responsibility for the output of automatic systems? Since I wrote the first draft of this paper, you've had uh, Facebook come out and say, we need to fix what Facebook is doing. Uh, even in the last couple of days, you've had the FBI come out and confirm that there were Russians using social media, I think Facebook and Instagram were mentioned, to at least disrupt thinking in the American community, maybe influence the, the outcomes of an election. Now, I don't know exactly how they did that, but they've clearly worked out how the algorithms work and they've started to use them to their advantage. And one of the issues, it appears, is that uh, algorithms can be self-feeding and so if you express an interest in a particular topic and then some false statement, some fake news, genuine fake news is posted, you may have that fed to you on your social media. You in turn might think, well that's very interesting and you pass it on to other people and so on. And so uh, by, by showing an interest in a topic you get fed automatically the false news about that topic and the system is such that it gets spread and the more outrageous the false news is, the fake news is, often the faster it will actually spread. So instead of social media being a conduit for accurate reporting of news, it's a conduit for fake news. Now, I want to distinguish between fake news and what I call reverse fake news. So fake news is where it's genuinely incorrect, but it's propagated through social media and so on as I've just described. Reverse fake news is where you actually have a true story but it is dismissed with statements that it's fake news. So reverse fake news is saying that fake news, that's fake news, when in fact it's not fake news, it's actual, actual uh, correct news. And so you see that in American politics at the moment. We've run out of time, Ed. I found this very interesting, and I've enjoyed this conversation with you, and I just wondered if you've got any final comments. 
Look, I think if this idea is embraced, then the financial services industries have a lot of work to do in this whole area. And it's non-trivial work. It's not even clear to me the best way to actually tackle it. But for institutions to ignore social risk, I think is absolute folly. And you can see that with the results that we've got today with the Royal Commission. I'd just like to thank you, Ian, for contributing the paper, which I found very interesting, and for taking the time to join us here today. So I'd just like to wrap there by saying look out for further articles about risk for financial business on actuaries.digital. You can get in touch with us at the actuaries at actuaries.asn.au with comments on today's conversation. And there are others, so look out for episodes and papers in our Dialogue Thought Leadership series and head to the Public Policy and Media section of our website for more of the latest research from the actuaries. I'm Rick Shaw. Bye for now.